So this morning, we get to do two ordinances, um, which is the Lord's Supper, which we just participated. That's a way in which, as we just observed, for us to renew our faith in Christ, to say we still believe. We believe in the body. We believe in the blood. We believe in Christ Jesus. Uh, at the end of the message, we're going to have uh, four, four people who are here today are going to be uh, baptized. And we're going to hear their, yeah, we can, we can, we can cheer for them. That's, that's, that's good. And these are folks who have uh, committed to Christ and uh, have believed and they're following Christ in baptism. And so we're going to hear parts of their story. And of course, we're going to we're going to be baptized high and lifted up up there, a baptismal tank. I told them to put just cold water in today, so I hope that's okay. No. <laughs> Thank the Lord it's going to be warm-ish. It's going to be warm-ish. And so uh, we get both of these things, and it's good for us um, personally to remember our faith. It's good for us to support those who have put their faith in Christ. And it's good for us to worship. It's good for us to consider the words of Christ, the words of Scripture. And so every morning we do pray. We pray for about 45 minutes or so before the service. And we ask that God would meet us, that he would open our hearts, that he would draw people to himself. I firmly believe that you're here today because it's God's will for you to be here today. More than just an invitation um, by a friend, more than just you know, driving by a sign, that God has you here. And so know that you have been prayed for today. And perhaps you've already heard something that has hit your heart. Perhaps it'll happen later on in the service. I don't know. But my hope is that there'll be one thing that, that connects with you. One thing that um, God speaks to you. And I know that we come to this place in lots of different conditions, right? All of us have things going on. Things at home that may be, you know, difficult or confusing. Some stresses we may have with our loved one, our spouse, or children, or grandchildren. These things, I know, we all carry them. And some of us, most of us are probably a mix of things we're super grateful for and then some things that we're concerned about. God knows those things, right? He hears you. He sees you. He knows you. And we can pray to him. What a great invitation. And this morning, we get to continue to read and hear and look into a prayer that Jesus made. And we've been walking through the Gospel of John for a long time. I think this is message 42 or 43. And we've been seeing Christ being revealed. And the apostle who wrote this book wrote it so that we would understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing in him, and this is our tagline for this series, we would have life in his name. We've seen Christ go through so much as we read about him and have read about him. And now he is just on the cusp of being betrayed by one of his friends, Judas. And he's together with his closest friends, the apostles, those who would carry the message and write the words that we have in the, in the New Testament. And we see his heart in really uh, amazing ways. And right before he's going to be betrayed, and we're going to get into that next week, he prays. We have this beautiful, holy, insightful, profound prayer. Two weeks ago, we read about what Jesus prayed for himself, and probably a little different than maybe you would anticipate. He prayed that God would glorify him, the Father would glorify him. So that he would glorify God. He was looking that God would be glorified. Last week we read about how then Jesus turned to pray for those who were with him in that place. The apostles. Thanking God that they were a firm foundation, so to speak. That God put them together. He prayed for their protection from the flesh and from the devil and from the world would go against them, that they would be one in him and one with each other. And then lastly, Jesus turns to pray for all those who would believe because of their message. And like Ashley shared, it is just a remarkable thing that as Jesus was going to go and to, be, and to endure, and he knew what he was going to endure, um, 
Endure, excuse me, from Psalm 22 talks about it in various places in the Old Testament. Excruciating, horrific um, pain and agony and suffering. He knew all of this was going to happen momentarily. And yet he prayed for you. He prayed for us. All believers of all times and all places. We are in his heart even right then. And let that truth just sink into you. The creator of the world who was voluntarily giving himself as the spotless lamb, the Passover lamb, to take what was due us because of our trespass, our sin, and our unrighteousness, the one who had never sinned, gave his life for us. And he thought about us. That's incredible, and I hope that grips you today. And so what he prayed is what was on his heart. And so from this, this short, these short verses, we learn some things of what Jesus wants for us. And it's important for us to pay attention to this prayer so that we can understand the heart of Christ and then look to follow him in this prayer and to live these things out and to pray and live similarly. So I'm going to read this entire, um, this entire prayer for us. This is John 17. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. We're going to start with verse 20. We're going to read these six verses to uh, verse 26. Then I'm going to circle back and we're going to focus in on just three things from this prayer of Jesus that I would like us to understand, to hear, appreciate, and incorporate. Okay, so this is John 17. This is the Bible right in front of you as well, if you don't have one with you. Uh, NIV version, and I'm just going to read it, and we're going to circle back. So here we go. Jesus said, my prayer is not for them alone, and that was the apostles who were there with him. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you, Father, have sent me. Now I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and I have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I've made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. That is Christ's prayer for us, for all those who would believe. So the first thing I want us to take note of is this, that Jesus wants us to be unified with each other in him. Okay. I specifically worded it that way. This is not unity for unity's sake. This is not unity and because we live in a certain place, like the same things, are interested in um, similar items. This is the unity that can only take place because we are connected to him. Now, if you remember, just a couple chapters back, Jesus taught in John chapter 15 about the vine and the branches. Remember that? He says that he is the vine and we are the branches. And we are to abide in him, be connected to him. And if we are connected to him, his life will flow to us, creating in us Christ's likeness or things as of the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and uh, patience and kindness and goodness and 
self-control. So he gave this illustration that apart from him, by the way, he said in John 15, we can do nothing but connected to him, we will bear fruit. And as we are connected to him, we are also connected to all people that are in him from all times and all places. In places like Kenya, in places like Vietnam and Myanmar and various places throughout all the ages. And so, as he was praying for us, the church, the primary thing that was on his mind is that we would remain connected to him. Right? Because if we live life and we grow up in church and perhaps at one time we believed and we got disconnected or disbelieved, we are cut off from Christ and by default we are then cut off from each other. The primary of primary importance and the primary thing that was on Jesus' mind and, and his heart that we would remain connected to him, us and him, and we, um, uh, us and him, and he and us, like the Trinity itself. Our unity is based on something eternal the Trinity. Greater than any mountain or any building or any organization or any church. It's in the Trinity. And so when you are connected to Christ, you are connected to a family that is way bigger than those who sit around your Thanksgiving table. right? Connected to people all over the place. And I'm looking forward to the great grand family reunion, right? And it's described in the book of Revelation where all tribes and peoples and tongues and nations are gathered together. It's precious. It is holy. And so he prayed that we would be connected to him intimately, knowing each other experiencing life and the goodness that is there. And we would carry each other in our hearts. Now, if you know, if you have children, you understand what this means, right? We have two daughters, and one lives in California, one lives in Tennessee. And we're not physically in the same place very often anymore. But I carry them in my heart. Right? And you know that as parents and grandparents. You carry them in your heart. And their concerns are my concerns. And their joys are my joys. And if there's suffering, it's our suffering as well. Right? It's carrying each other. And they do the same for their parents. They love us and we know that. God help us. To carry each other in our hearts, you understand that, right? The people that are two pews in front of you, or over there, or someone you just met today, or someone's not here because of certain conditions. God, help us to have that love, that, here it is, unity, that oneness. Even though we're separated in places like Kenya, that we carry each other in our hearts, this is what Christ prayed for. And it is for us, and it's good for us, and it's healthy and helpful for us. It's for us, but it's not solely about us. Right? Jesus connected that, if we just read there in that passage, that the world would know that. So there's something mm, evangelistic in our unity or love for one another, right? Even in this room, there's folks from all over the city, different backgrounds, different ages, different educational opportunities, different skin tones, different languages, and we are here because we are in Christ and we are unified regardless of any of these things that separate so much in our world, right? That's Incredible, right? Wouldn't it be wonderful? And we pray for this, right? When people would come into this place, and people have come into this place, we pray that 
they would say, look how they love each other and look how they love me. Let's be of that. That people would say, I want some of that. I don't know about this Jesus and, you know, they're kind of weird, but you know what? I think they really like me (laughs) and love me. (laughs) I like our weirdness, by the way. This is what Jesus prayed for, right? Praying for us, church, throughout the ages, praying that we would be connected because we are connected in him, that Christ would be in us as the Father is in the Son, the Son's in the Father. We carry each other in our hearts, that we would be one, that we would be unified. And we saw just last week where indeed our own flesh, because we get cranky, we want to separate, or we get full of shame, or we get whatever, or the enemy wants to come in and drive wedges, and you know, oh, oh sorry, I'm really sorry. <laughs> the guy doesn't know how to use a microphone, it hurts my ears, like I don't know if I want to be there, or those people just don't like me. You kind of know how that goes, right? We get separated and we get disconnected and like, well, I don't know about going to church or I don't know about praying and all of this stuff. We just drift away and get disconnected and it is horrible. So we have to be aware of this. We have to understand Christ's desire for us. And by the way, this fruit that is found in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, helps us to stay connected to each other. Often we need a lot of patience with each other. We can say amen to that, right? We need kindness to stay connected, right? Sometimes we're hard to live with, right? Sometimes I'm hard to live with. I'll just put it on me, right? We need love, right? We need goodness. We need self-control. These things help us, by the way, stay in community, right? Without them... We're pretty egotistical, perhaps angry, become bitter, self-centered, all of the rest, which all of those things, by the way, all it does is cause division. That's what it does. So his fruit and our connection to him help us to keep connected to each other. So Jesus wants us to be unified with each other in him. If you feel disconnected to the body of Christ, I want to encourage you, you get closer to Christ. Right? You do that, he'll give you love for his body. Hear me. It's not trying to try harder to be connected or to like someone you don't like. Right? It's not, oh, I just got to try harder. Mm. You know what? Lean into Christ. Love him more. Ask him to give you his love and then it'll go this way. You understand how that works? Okay. You'll see a transformation in the work of God in your heart as you see the answer to this prayer. So the first thing Jesus prayed for, Jesus wants us to be united with each other and him. Second thing we see, Jesus wants us to experience his goodness for all eternity. Right? This is verse 24. I'm going to read it for us here again. It says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. And as I talked about a couple weeks ago, the glory that is in Christ is his goodness. Okay. We experience the goodness of God or the goodness of Christ, his provision for us, for the forgiveness of our sin, his love for us to be connected to us by the Holy Spirit, his goodness in even all of creation. And we experience the goodness of God, we experience the goodness of Christ, and therefore we give him glory. And so when Christ says, hey, I want them to be with me, okay, That's good news for us, that we would see his glory. That means in eternity, we're going to experience all or the full extent of the goodness of God. 
says, I want them to be with me, and I want to be with them so they can know the glory that is in me before the Father created the world. Right? Do you know heaven's going to be really good? Right? Now, unfortunately, some of us have this really lame idea of what heaven's going to be like. We think it's going to be a forever long hymn sing that never stops. Now, some of you are like, yes! You know, but you know what? You know, hymn number 1,462, you might get a little distracted. Right? Heaven is going to be, number one, perfect. We're going to be in perfect relationship with each other. In perfect bodies. Full use of all of our faculties. Full use of all of our limbs. In a perfect recreated world that extends even into all of the universe in which we can't even comprehend how big it is. I trust that we'll be able to explore not just this remade planet, but for way beyond. Right? There's going to be things that are exciting for you to do. Right? Things to explore, places to go in perfect connection and harmony with each other, in perfect glory of God, in the fullness of unmarred and unfallen creation for forever. It is going to be new and fresh and good and exciting. Scripture says that we can't even comprehend in our state right now the extent of the goodness and the glory of God for eternity. Right? I want that vision to grip you. When we talk about you at your funeral, guess what? The best is yet to come. Right? It's hard down here, right? There's people who wear shorts in the snow, like, <laughs> what? Stop. <laughs> Things are difficult. <laughs> there's relational pain, there's heartache, there's physical pain, there's, what's the word, suffering of many kinds. We're promised that there's a day where there will be no more. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more suffering. Those who are dead in Christ are not dead. They're alive. Christ is alive and we have his promise. If we can't trust Jesus the Christ, we can't trust anybody. And he promises he'll come back going to make all things new. And he wants to be with us where he is so we can experience the full extent of the goodness of God and therefore we'll give him glory. Right now we just see glimpses of it and we praise. We trust. We persevere. But then there will be no veil that covers our eyes. We're going to see clearly. This is 1 Corinthians 13 talks about this. That is exciting. And Jesus expressed that in this prayer as he prayed for our unity and our connection to each other, our connection primarily to him. He says, ah, I want to be with them. I can't wait that we're going to be together for all eternity. It's going to be amazing. It's like a giddy six-year-old waiting for their birthday, Right? You remember that, right? When you're five. I get that type of heart I think, from this. And here's Jesus. Here's the deal seeing beyond the cross. He still had that in his sight, but for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You remember this? The joy was. You, us, 
being with him and of his goodness. He says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to endure this because of the joy and the love that I have. It's incredible. Hope that helps you this morning. Jesus prayed this for us. He wants us to experience his goodness for all eternity. I put a lot of verses in your notes, a lot of places you can look up. Please do say, I want to know more about this. There's there and there's other places that I didn't list. Let us greatly rejoice in them. Now, the third thing in this prayer of Christ for us is this, that Jesus wants us to know the Father and his love. This is profound. This is verse 25. Righteous Father, Jesus prayed, though the world does not know you. Now, the world can know a lot of things about God through what is called um, general grace, or, or, or revelation, we can know things about God through what he has made. Like if you are a, um, a guitar maker, right, and you make this guitar, make it beautiful, sounding great, what have you, and it gets sold perhaps down in California because they love guitars in California. <laughs> I, I have no idea, right? And so whomever buys it will probably never know the, the craftsperson who, who made this guitar, but they can know about the craftsperson from what was made. They have attention to detail, right? Look at how well this is made. They really care about what they do and all of these things, but they'll never know the person who made it, right? And so when Jesus addressed the Father with this phrase, he doesn't do this very often, actually just one time here. Righteous Father, right? He says they're not going to know your righteousness, your rightness, the full extent of your righteousness seen in both your justice and your redemption and your love. They're going to know some things about you if they have eyes to see about the mountains and planets and how everything flows together. They're going to know some things, but they're not going to know you. They're going to know you to an extent of your creation, but they won't know your heart as these people will know you. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, Jesus says, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. We know to a greater extent the heart of of the Father through the life of the Son. Right? That's why Jesus came to reveal the Father. We read about this, right? Which is in your salvation, absolutely, but ultimately it's about Him and His glory, Him and His goodness, Him and His life in us, right? And so Jesus showed this power, the goodness of the Father through making things that were wrong right. Healing people, speaking to creation and it obeyed, taking things like fish and bread and multiplying it to feed people, knowing what's in people's minds and in their hearts, speaking what is true and even raising the dead. Only God can do these things. Glimpses of his goodness, tastes of or foretaste of what is yet to come. This is amazing. And Jesus came to reveal the Father. I've made you, verse 26, I've made you known to them and will continue to make you known. The Holy Spirit is continuing to work, right? My hope is a year from now you know more about God than you actually know right now. The Holy Spirit is working, right? Illuminating His Word, speaking to our hearts, giving us eyes to see, ears to hear. I know a lot more about God now than I did when I was 17 years old, right? And some of it, 
uh, is, is more, it's more than just information, it's experiential knowledge. I know now what it's like to go through difficulty with Christ. I know what it's like to experience the joy of relationship. I know what it's like to have my sins forgiven. I know what it's like to have the comfort of God when I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, right? You understand this, right? We know more and more. So not only did Christ reveal the Father, he continues to reveal him. God give us eyes to see, ears to hear. He will continue to make him known. Verse 26. Why? In order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus wants us to know the Father and his love. As we know the Father, we'll become more in love with Christ. And as we are more in love with Christ, we will glorify and become more in love with the Father. It's a beautiful thing. May Christ be the highest treasure and your most precious possession. In order to love him more, you need to see more of him, his goodness. And in his goodness, we praise him. And this will help you each and every day. So that's the prayer. It is pointed. It is powerful. And it helps us. Next week, we're going to turn the page. We're going to then look through and delve into his betrayal and his crucifixion. Resurrection, of course, and the reinstatement of Peter. There's lots more yet to come. But it's good for us to absorb these things this morning. So this is what I want you to think about. Okay. Number one, in his prayer for oneness or unity, I want you to ask a question. Do I feel connected to Christ? How am I doing being connected to others through Christ? Am I carrying people in my heart or has my love grown cold? Right? The prayer is that God would re-stoke that fire for him in our hearts today. And soften our hearts perhaps to other people. I want you to think about that. And pray about it and draw closer to Christ. Perhaps for you, life is just super tough right now. There's stuff you're carrying that hardly anybody, if anybody, knows about. Know that you have a Father who does care, who does hear. Know that there will be a time when everything will be made new again. <laughs> perfect relationship in perfect conditions. Know the heart of Christ that he draws us to himself and can't wait for you and I to know the extent or full extent of his goodness. I want us to think about how the Father, how the Son is revealing the Father to us. I want you to pray, God, help me to see your goodness even in the midst of my circumstances. God, help me to see your goodness even today. That's a great prayer, by the way. Right? You'll start to Observe things, know things. You start to understand more about Christ and in so doing, understand the love of the Father for you, which then empowers you then to connect to the greater world, not because you want love, but because you have been loved already and you're here to spread the knowledge of Christ to those around us. It's beautiful. So think about those things. The Apostle Paul, I'm going to conclude with this passage and we're going to turn to baptism. 
The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 sums up this um, well in a few verses. I'm going to read it for us. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And here is Paul the Apostle, um, older in his life, more than likely, praying this. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, and he was literally in prison, urges us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called. We as Christians are called to be apprentices of Jesus, to know him, to walk after him, to be like him. He says, hey, walk that way. And he helps us to do it. With all humility, verse 2, and gentleness, with patience. These are fruits of the Spirit. Bearing with one another in love. Verse 3, that we would be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body. There's churches right now meeting throughout Rockford and literally this day throughout the world, but we're one, right? We're just a part of this outpost, right? But we're one. There's just one body. There's one Holy Spirit, right? Not different ones for different people. One that is in us. There's one body. There's one spirit, just as you were called to. One hope. And this hope belongs to your call. We're called to him and we're called to be with him by his promises. This is our calling together. There's just one Lord. There's just one faith. There's just one baptism. There's one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Regardless if you're in Kenya wherever you are. This helps it. So God help us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. So I'm going to pray for us and then we are going to transition into baptism. God, thank you so much for sending your son. We read about him in your word. We read about what the prophets said what will happen and who this would be. We read about the prayers of those who have gone before us, and then we read about Jesus. The Son of God came to take away the sins of the world, the the Son of God who revealed the Father to us. The Son of God who made so many precious promises Son of God who sent the Holy Spirit to live in us, to guide us, to convict us, to empower us, to bear fruit in us. God, I pray for this body, this congregation who is here this morning. Speak to us. And you have. Help us to remember what you have said even this morning, God. Help us to be more and more like you, Jesus. May our hope rise up. May our faith be firmly established. May our love for each other be evident, Lord. And may people come to know you, Christ, the goodness of God and the hope of so grateful that we can renew our faith and communion together. So grateful that we can be here and give each other hugs and encouragement and prayer. So grateful that we can celebrate with brothers and sisters who have put their faith in you. Be with them. Bless them, God. Thank you for continuing to conform us into the image of your Son. We give you praise and we look forward to the goodness that is yet to come. May that hope and anticipation 
be in us like a six-year-old excited for their birthday. And may that joy and your joy be ours. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.